Don Rev, buena tarde. Well, good uh, evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, event organized from the uh, New Horizons Foundation, uh, sub an event supported by the collaboration of the and, this, and, and the help of uh, from the Henrik Sefold Foundation and the Green European Foundation. Both of them help us to organize this event. Secondly, I would like you to know, those of you who are here and those of you who are following us via Zoom, that uh, you have simultaneous interpreting. So on your screen at the bottom, there should be a symbol that uh, should allow you to have access to the simultaneous interpretation. And with no further ado, I would like to mention that I have people next to me and people who are not next to me. Some people are connected from abroad. I will introduce their CV. First of all, we'll have David Lois. He's a professor of psycho social psychology at UNED, expert in urban mobility. And he's also a researcher at the Center of Transport Research. We'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you, David. Secondly, we have Georgina Montesino, and she's an engineer, a member of the Association of uh, Public Transport Association, who always make say, important contributions. I know that they've been uh, working on, on the topic of, of interest today. And then we have the Laura Diego. Thank you very much for being here from the Secretary of Fair Transition of Comisiones Obreras Catalonia, the Union. She, she's dealt with the topic um, quite widely. And then we have Lina. Oh my God, he cannot pronounce your last name. So I'm not going to even attempt to say it. Uh, she is an expert in uh, the area of mobility and particularly mobility and gender. Well, before we start, I will make a, a, a quick round uh, in that same, very same order of introduction. Oh, well, how did you, well, this debate starts from the point that well, we uh, agree uh, on uh, mo sustainable mobility. Some people say that are in favor, some others that are not so much in favor, but here we have a consensus about sustainable mobility. The question therefore is uh, entering into the complexity of it all. How can we make it fair? That's why we can we turn sustainable mobility a clear thing that should consider the social dimension, the redistributive, um, um, to, to make a, a fair transition beyond, uh, beyond the, the, the concept of, of a green transition. That's why we'd like to focus on this debate. With no further ado, as I said, I would like to give the floor to uh, David, who's connected with us from Bilbao. Good evening, everyone. I have a brief presentation that will take me less than 15 minutes. To tell you the truth, I will play the Jiminy Cricket uh, because I will change the question, the order of the question, and I will share my screen with you. And here you have it. It's following the line of what we observe in, in our debate, which is very interesting. I'd like to thank uh, the two foundations that invited me to, to be here, making sustainable compatible with social justice. And my question was, is it, uh, is, is it fair, uh, the, the status quo we are having right now? That's my, my question. In the debate, we could maybe talk in further detail about the readjustments that we will need to do. But I would like to review, to, to revisit this, this situation currently. Different uh, possibilities. Let me see if I can eliminate the upper banner. Well, in the case of pollution of oxygen, nitrogen and suspension, uh, particles generated by diesel engines. So what we've seen in uh, normal uh, conditions in big cities is that we have a greater exposition of these particles in low income neighborhoods because they support high traffic flows and the same with noise. And children 
uh, who are greatly affected by because they are growing the pre uh, teenagers kids boys girls and 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 the elderly are very vulnerable so we have the intersectionality uh, we have children and elderly who live in areas that are more deprived uh, and uh, so these neighborhoods are more negatively affected with respect to the uh, uh, road violence well quite the same unfavored neighborhoods often have less uh, traffic uh, uh, um, relax uh, or uh, uh, with greater uh, amounts of uh, accidents in spain we have 250 people died uh, run over by by vehicles and symmetrically, this falls amongst the people above 65 years of age. One of the reasons why is this driven design we have that generates an environmental stress, particularly for people who are not in good shape. Other relevant data includes, uh, well, uh, information from the UK, and we can see that with respect to uh, home uh, incomes, the risk of being run over by a, a, a vehicle and, and fall while walking is three times greater amongst low uh, income levels and groups. And we can also see with respect to this, this, this capacity, six or four times uh, more likelihood to, to, to fall while walking or, or being run over by a vehicle. Well, this, uh, this tells us more about the state of quo. And, and road violence. Here I have a, a, a pop-up that, that keeps them interfering with my presentation. Well, false uh, focus on um, elderly women who move around their neighborhood because they have to go to the doctor or they go shopping, etc. Other data that I thought uh, I could uh, talk about is the climate crisis issue homes are the worst uh, isolated in, 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 in low-income neighborhoods and homes this rule of 330 300 is not fulfilled and then we have the effect of uh, uh, block heat because we have more asphalt more um, concrete uh, we have another variable low income usually depend more on the public transport means which is the only way of transport that is 100 percent inclusive and accessible and well normally and then buses etc uh, suffer the uh, effect of congestion traffic congestion well as a social psychology this is quite relevant what uh, has to do with different possibilities oftentimes not very well measured of the effects of the type of city that was designed after the 1950s last century decreasing meeting points decreasing opportunities of social interaction this generates more marginality uh, urbanistic uh, coldness and less cooperation amongst people in that respect all this turns cities in a, in a crossroad and this uh, is connected to more sedentarism less well-being more uh, social uh, lack of trust and greater index of unwanted loneliness in a nursing and congress that i attended to i could see the greater um, concentrations of people in urban centers generates higher percentages that go to 25 percent of population of people over 65 this seems to be uh, a perfect storm coming to us we've heard about the epitome of unwanted loneliness the feeling of loneliness and the consequences this has on health status with respect to data further data i reviewed some some data about this issue the use of car depending on your income levels and i could see uh, uh, a piece of research that was presented to the media uh, in the metropolitan area of barcelona we see that we have two important pieces of information divided 
by the Metropolitan Area of Barcelona and Barcelona Municipal, the Municipality of Barcelona. And here we see a general effect of the typology of uh, well, private transport, the more car dependence, it generates a, a, a global effect. But then income in gray, we have the uh, use of normal um, movements from place to place of car and motor motorcycle 21 percent approximately these are net income levels this is low income here we are in the middle uh, or high levels and there's a difference of 10 points between using the car in favor of middle and high income levels in barcelona capital and the same this huge gap we have in the metropolitan area and practically with no changes in low income when using the car so when we have determined the issues of equality etc we can talk about cars as uh, an element that uh, are uh, that elements that are regressive the amount of cars and kilometers run with this uh, this happens uh, quite often and we have data in both budget in barcelona and in other countries both in uh, Europe as in the North America, in different cities. So this is an idea that we have to keep in mind. Uh, I didn't include here uh, the uh, transfer, uh, transfers by airplane, but there's a relationship uh, between municipalities of the metropolitan area and the use of public transport. And we can clearly see that even if there is no clear linear relation, there's a trend in the, well, the greater public transport, the lower the income levels. Well, we've seen that the famous aids towards the consumption of fuels that didn't achieve the goals expected because of a market consideration and oligopoly. Well, it's not really worth mentioning this, but ultimately with respect to fuels, the uh, the deciles uh, spent uh, twice more times when having a high income level versus the low income levels. Well, another piece of information that I really like is the external costs. This is a piece of information from the European Commission. External costs of uh, road transport cost us 800 billion uh, euro per year and 60% of these costs here you have the, them defined uh, is paid by society as a whole this is quite an interesting piece of information that will be used to connect with the issue of fairness and finally the uh, ensemble the total of the population is very much in favor of making changes in cities here we are talking about walkability um, bike lanes speed controls all this is to do with the representative several of an insurance uh, a car insurance company and this is another um, another another study that was done during the pandemic uh, transport and environment most of the european society was able to, to reduce space for motorized uh, traffic and and turn it into this uh, new well this is like a, a recurrent idea about this and and that's all. all I have to say, but maybe I'll, I'll talk uh, about it maybe later during the debate. Thank you very much. Excellent, David. In fact, a strong uh, piece of information, strong, strong information you gave us. Georgina, now you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. When you can please uh, upload the, my, my presentation. My name is Georgina. I come from the Association Promotion of Public Transport. And as our name says, well, we focus on public transportation. We were asked to talk about the urban toll. And if we go to the next slide, one more. There we have it. Talking about the urban toll, we have to put into context where we are standing right now. In the next slide, we have a summary of how we, uh, what we are doing now. First question, 
how much is it to move a person from point A to point B in the orange line? We have the cost of the system. This is, comes from the um, Association of Public Transportation in Barcelona. And in the black line, we have the information about travelers, 2020, 2021, things went down, pandemic, you know. But we can see, and we've seen from a long time that there is a decoupling. Uh, every time it's, it's more difficult and more expensive to move people in public transport. We have a certain cost, uh, and, and who pays for it? This will be answered with the green and gray lines. The gray lines is the user's contribution, and the green is the contribution made by the or from the administration. The public transportation system is shared between users and the administration. We can see that in pandemic times, the administration make, made an important effort, and the concept here is clear. The, uh, the administration had a small deficit. They had to maintain a status quo uh, costs a system, but there are not enough validations and in the administrations. And we can see how everything is distributed. Such a distribution is totally. Can we go to the next slide, please? It's totally random. In there is no specific percentage of each one of them. In the specific case of the. Um, of Barcelona, it includes government, uh, municipality, and the AMB, which is the Association of Transport. And well, let's add to the crisis we had the fact that in the year 2012, we already had a reduction of uh, the contribution of the government in order to cover the public transportation costs. So the administration, once again, they started with a deficit because they had to absorb the, the cost that the state is not accepting. So, yeah, we thought everything sounds good, but if we are going to have these fluctuations, what will happen? Well, we may believe that there are some laws behind. Thank you. Maybe I am very speaking very, I'm speaking very fast, she says. Well, she is actually. Um, there are some laws, but they, these laws are not deployed. In Catalonia, we have a law passed um, unanimously that has not been deployed. The, uh, the taxing instruments have not been used. One of them could be the urban toll that we can talk about later. In fact, they are faced, uh, they are gathered. Well, these mechanisms are, are, are gathered here. It's not that something that we just made up. It's something that already exists, the, the urban tolls, the municipal fees to, to have access to uh, to a city. So it's a, for example, the case as, as London is not deployed. A state law will be make this more attractive. But now this gives us an idea about how we will deal with this. Then this law will be deployed in springtime, supposedly. And it has some parts that are good. It'll improve the current mechanisms. But on the other hand, in spite of that, it has to be, uh, it has to follow in mechanisms of equality. That's what we're asking for, at least. Well, this should be harmonized with uh, what we had in the past. And what we had was, we didn't know who was offering what because everything was changing every year, depending on the crisis that we've gone through, it's been changing. So we are starting to talk about percentages, but we are speaking about a maximum percentage that will be offered by the state according to the operational cost, but it doesn't talk about a minimum. Minimums are not well known. We have the minimum for users. We have a huge um, part or uh, we, at least in Barcelona, we have at least 30 recuperating, but we are not told about the minimum that the government should offer uh, minimum subvention to guarantee trans public transport. We can go to the next one. We, well, there are two deficit scenarios in, in, in COVID. When state uh, aids are reduced, we receive a, a fund to, to palliate the uh, Ukraine crisis, 13 billion euro. And well, as we heard before, out of this 13 billion euro, 5,000, oh, I'm sorry, 
5 billion will be or have been used to, to support fuels private vehicles are paid by by the higher incomes and for lower incomes the government said we'll use 300,000 I'm sorry she corrected herself 1 billion no 200 200 million for free transport all this done without studying what we just showed how the current status quo is with respect to the public transport systems and administrations the question is is this a, a measure to favor uh, or, or to, 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 to support the, the climate change well this is a special measure of because it, we uh, a big investment was made in uh, fuels to help private company uh, some private uh, owners and, 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 and companies that benefits much higher income levels and this is relegated to this concept so it doesn't really make sense to say we'll do it for the climate change but on the other hand we will try to benefit uh, private uh, vehicles next one please so um considering this uh, scenario we presented a possible solution which is within these uh, taxing mechanisms which is the urban uh, toll in the next slide i think you all know what an urban toll is like this is one of the measures that has worked best in many uh, international experiences it's very well known in the case of london but there are uh, this but this is also applicable in other countries and results are positive why do we believe that an urban toll is necessary well next slide explains it on the one hand barcelona which is where we would like to in, implement this urban toll is one of the city with the greatest density of uh, vehicles and these vehicles are not used 100 percent the average use is 1.19 people we don't reach two people per vehicle but on the other hand we use over 60 percent 65 percent actually of the urban space so we are devoting a lot of urban space to a vehicle that is not moving just one person and something 1.19 percent is this measure enough to incentivate the moral change that's what we are intending to achieve obviously uh, uh, just one measure like zero costs well won't force a model change we have to add other measures that we call the attack plan which are complementary measures to recon reconvert the uh, urban areas like in the case of barcelona we have uh, uh, an urban highway or motorway called La Me the avenida meridiana to pacify to reduce the amount of lanes we include the bus lanes a bus a, a bike lane that will help the current infrastructure all these complementary measures complementary to, to an urban toll should be propitiated to guarantee that the urban toll can be used and, and is good we defend uh, measures that are restrictive such as the urban toll or um, freedom of use if they come on their own they will do nothing you will achieve maybe a peak for a moment so there's a small model change but if you want to maintain that change you have to undertake other measures like for example public transport improving the frequency improving the quality of services etc more particularly what we observe for barcelona it's a four euro toll that coincides with the area of low emissions area that has a, a legal framework and we can add it to it in the next one we see the summary of what i just said what we intend to achieve with these measures other than promoting the modal change is well to reduce the transit flow we currently have a lot of traffic and, and well we have some some measures that can uh, help to in that attempt also these measures come with an income is part of the funding of the public transportation together with the public uh, health care system but this would allow us to have some 
kind of a st structure in the funding of public transfer so that it doesn't depend on users and on the administration. There should be mechanisms with which we can, can generate the, the income and, and private vehicles should be de-incentivized to start using public transport means increasing an offer etc benefits that we expect to uh, to achieve is listed are listed here let's go to the next slide because here we have an important thing to consider just to finish my my um, introduction this fits very well in the the uh, the, the topic of the, the session measures such as uh, Three, uh, zero payment can favor very specific groups, people, the elderly people with difficulties. Um, but this is, um, well, we have, well, we have a next one. We have the current scenario in uh, Catalonia. We have 10,000 agents involved in the social actions and each one has different criteria, different ways of implementing uh, different sources. Some tickets that can be bought in one place, but not in the other. Anyway, there is a quite sad panorama with respect to looking for information. If a person comes here for the first time and tries to find such uh, rates, well, they won't be able to use or find it easily. Uh, ATMs only have a social fees amongst young people, teenagers, uh, monoparental and, and numerous families and people in the situation of uh, unemployment, but also for the elderly people with disabilities or, or, or risk of exclusion, there is nothing, absolutely nothing. And we are going to go step beyond with respect to the four ATMs, which are the four <clears throat> companies of the different provinces of Catalonia that manage the, the mobility fees, well, there is a big difference in prices with respect to the T Young, which is the card for young people. It only exists in Barcelona province. In the rest of Catalonia, there's nothing about that. The young people of the rest of Catalonia don't move, or if they move, they will have to try to find their discount, their special fee. But what I believe is even worse is that in Barcelona, we still have a T17 that goes from four to 16 years of age, mandatory education structures. But in the rest of Catalonia, kids don't seem to go to the Institute because it's only applicable um, to 12 years of age. Well, this is the comparison we have and that we can see as everything is focused in Barcelona. And even in Barcelona, we know that uh, we are missing some things. We also know that we have a lot more than in other areas of Catalonia. This <clears throat> is important to consider. I don't know how it's 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 a comparative uh, agreement with respect to different territories of the same country. <clears throat> we cannot have uh, all these difficulties. As uh, and if we go to the next slide, we'll see that we can have a comparative analysis by territory. There is not an integrated ticket. For example, during the week, I am in my, my municipality. I move around with my card, but when I want to go and spend my weekend with other people, I have to use a very expensive ticket. I had to pay for it. It's not integrated. And therefore, once I go to the other place, I have to buy another ticket to move around there. What do I do at, at the end? Well, I take my car. This is the answer. If we don't propitiate a, a system like simple tickets or group tickets, <clears throat> both for uh, schools or uh, young people's associations, in the case of young people who have the T16 that they cannot uh, be used outside of their municipalities, so we'll need special card for groups, but only for school children. Also, when you go out with your friends, it's something that is, well, you know, it's cheaper to use a public transportation system than a car. And sometimes uh, taking your car, if you divide everything into five, because it's five people that fit in the car, it is cheaper than if you take a train. Information is crucial here. Social fees, fair fees, fees that are for everyone. They can, well, that can be hidden. You have to find it easily. 
surfing the web or simply asking if we go to the next slide we'll see that in this case that this summarizes what we just said before it's true that atm doesn't have special fees for the elderly well the other body has it but no not really the other body has fees that are not good for remfi for for the uh, uh, nearby uh, trains the, the trains of the nearby area we have other trains that cannot be used in uh, different times of the day well it's a real mess believe me uh, people uh, don't really feel like taking public transportation after certain age groups or amongst young people because it's cheaper to share a car or because uh, well, there's such a big amount of information that is generating a disinformation and i don't uh, have uh, anything else to say for the moment as a final consideration i would like to say that what we hope to see is that these measures that are that, uh, are taking place these discounts uh, uh, that 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 graciousness uh, is, is something that will happen now but that we don't know it will happen in the future people are applauding here in the room david made a, a good contribution with respect to, to the, the levels of income you also talked about the territorial and generational balance when we talk about social aspects we're not speaking about income levels definitely but there is another important dimension which is the generational and territorial balance balances when we want to turn this into uh, justice and, and and justice has to be uh, applicable in different social spheres volumes of people big volumes of people that on the one hand or the other can be uh, well, can be out of the area of protection the public transportation or sustainable mobility may may give let me give the floor to laura sí sí vale doncs gràcies per la invitació eh bueno yo també llegaré algunas cosas que han dit també al david i la gina well, i will connect to with some of the things that david and gina said i work in the union with respect to, to the area of sustainability uh, and uh, some uh, of my colleagues are members of their APTP they are it's part of their DNA but for a long time we considered the possibility of, of uh, mobility to treat it from uh, our union to deal with it because you may do without certain uh, transport but you know going to work you need to have a, a way of mobility we had to express an opinion and we accepted the, the paradigm of uh, cultural changes of sustainability. And we said, sure, um, we have to analyze this, but not in a naive way. We don't have to be so uh, purist that we don't see any problems. In fact, as we heard from our colleagues, the territorial differences, the differences in income levels, differences uh, to accessibility in public transport was an interesting thing for us besides the reasons that we heard uh, from the bit that we know and we accept because they are true the climate emergency in public health and the quality of air uh, public space uh, noises how they affect our health well, obviously we accept that but we are interested as a union to promote sustainable mobility uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the workplace for three main reasons. There may be more reasons, but I would like to point out three. Um, labor health. Public health is a good thing, but labor health is a different story. We know that year after year, except uh, the years 2020-2021 pandemic because of the uh, reduction of level of mobility and telework, uh, figures went down but we know that year after year there's an increase of labor accidents therefore um in the case of uh, catalonia 2019 includes 2000 uh, 20, uh, 20, 000, uh accidents some of them were very severe some of them were deadly um, we have to con consider that accidents in itinerary continue increasing and they have a mortality level attached to it such a mortality is part of, of, of 
of these accidents that cause death are due to transit or traffic accidents. Therefore, having to mandatorily use uh, uh, your own car or motorcycle is a risk factor because you may not have enough uh, options to, to take a public uh, transport system. Second element is the issue of the equity or, or, or inequality. It's true. Um, the possession of, of a car or the ownership of, of a car or a vehicle is quite selective. Not everyone can because of age considerations, income levels, gender sometimes, because if there is a, a, a vehicle in the family unit, there is a predominance of being used uh, by men rather than women because of uh, migrant peoples that do not uh, have their their um, driver's license convalidated in, in in spain they cannot have access to it maybe so in many areas uh, in uh, various labor spheres we could see that the only mobility policy is to facilitate the access with a private car with a private vehicle is a factor of exclusion. Young people who are practicing and don't have a driver's license, and oftentimes they want to work at a, comp at a company and through training, them, well, they, they want to go and work to an industrial polygon. There's no public transport. There's no way to have access. They, they say, no, I can't accept this training option and labor option. Uh, but also for companies, this may be a, a problem when having access to, to, to qualified workers that cannot have access to their company uh, through uh, uh, their, their own cars or, or vehicles. And another element that is being treated in this type of analysis is the uh, talent management, managing new talent. When we talk about companies that are very paradigmatic, telecoms, where they have professional workers from all over the place that focus in the hub. I'm thinking about uh, San Juan next to San, San Cugat. Yeah, well, these people value other topics, value other things. Man time management is very important, being able to combine the work, labor and family and not having to, to move around with their private uh, car. So accessibility with a good public transport offered is something that should be kept in mind by many companies. And uh, well, the third element that I wanted to, to uh, present to you is the collective issue, because um, from companies, uh, we see that mobility is, well, it's up to you, uh, something which is very individualized. Uh, if you accept a, a labor offer, you will have your own uh, means to, to get there. And we consider that uh, this, uh, is, this has to be an analyzed under a more collective perspective. That's why we ask responsibility to the uh, public administration, well, depending on their levels of responsibility. When um, there is a, a, a urban mobility plan, they should consider specifically the mobility due to labor and not mobility in general. Oftentimes, we see municipalities who don't face uh, the uh, the industrial polygon that uh, uh, or the industrial area that is 500 meters from from the city, and they don't extend the urban uh, uh, transport media and their transport means. And uh, am I running out of time? Well, well, come and also it's, it's applicable to companies. Companies have to be responsible of, of the of, of, of the transport of workers. Of, of the company, of the, of the headquarters, but also the outsourced services. It's difficult to, to include or not include in the mobility policies these people, visitors, collaborators, etc. They have to consider the whole range of possibilities because, in a nutshell, this is the way to calculate their, their CO2 footprint. They have to internalize things. This was something that we as a society had to accept well, this has to be internalized because there's no other alternative and in that respect an instrument that we think is very powerful but that is infrared are the company uh, transport plans in uh, industrial areas that are far from the uh, urban mesh we have industrial areas near barcelona like uh, 
El Besos area, Bon Pastor area, and all the other industrial areas that, that continue next to the Besos River. And they have difficulties, real difficulties. And uh, if, when, whenever there is free parking area, and well, you can invest in non-productive soil, uh, and that's you know that makes people people's lives happy, easier. But we may generate a problem of traffic congestion. How to manage the parking space? And there is a problem of ax traffic accidents increase, labor accidents that have an impact. Um, as far as costs are concerned to companies. So it, it's not just specific of, of industrial areas that are far from the, the downtown areas of cities, far and distance remote, very lost without uh, communication whatsoever. No, it's something which may happen frequently in any type of uh, industrial area, no matter how close or far it is from the center of the city. We have to understand that there should be an active participation of workers, this should be a dynamic instrument because we could see that the planning has not been analyzed, has not been reviewed in many, many years. And people bought maybe a, 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 an apartment, vital strategies will tell us to, to revisit this because some decades ago, People tried to live near where they worked, and there was less distance between the uh, homes and, 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 and the workplace. This has changed with relocations, uh, with all the policies or lack of policies of, of uh, social uh, housing. You don't have many alternatives. You tend to live farther and farther away. Now it seems like uh, things are changing. You know, I live outside because I can afford it. And I come to Barcelona because I had to. This is something that needs to be considered. And on the other hand, in the urban mobility plans, this should be considered, this should be kept in mind with the state law of climate change and, and energy transition. Well, they're considered the municipalities with over 50,000 people that must have a sustainable mobility plan while implementing low emission areas this uh, responsibility is there for us this is a key element to, to foster public transport and collective transport wherever you cannot uh, do it whatever you cannot create a specific public transportation line this can be group solutions with the crisis we've gone through this vision of industrial area may be a, a good incentive and a good instrument for quite a long time we heard about instruments like the creation of a, a, a mobility manager this is a figure that has been talked about it goes beyond this topic but in the the uh, national uh, agreement on industry that we signed some months ago one of the proposals was the law of industrial areas and this would be a good instrument to create these managers figure that manages many services services of mobility could be one of the services so we should work on the uh, rate integration in Leda, for example it's a real drama for our uh, friends there we have to break away from the first uh, circle the first crown uh, um, the, the urban integration this works for barcelona but beyond barcelona between uh, municipalities that do not cross Barcelona, that is where we have a problem with interurban buses. Let's think about this set of possibilities. We can incorporate new technologies as well. They may be our allies. We have uh, uh, many companies that uh, use uh, the area of mobility and they have an app that, you know, help people it's a matter of exploring these apps, exploring these possibilities, and maybe with respect to the industrial areas, uh, a solution could be found amongst the different companies, a feasible solution. I would like to insist on the fact that it is important to have workers participate in it, and unions as well, because oftentimes what we found was uh, implementation of a service, for example, a, a company bus, only for the matrix company of the company. 
And on those groups of people that have lower incomes, cleaning uh, people, catering people, um, watchmen, women, they would use that because of their, their economy, they would use but they, the service, but they are excluded. So we have to think from uh, or under a, a more social standpoint, it's not only uh, the economic standpoint is important, but it's everything is important. We have to see creative solutions and we can see many possibilities. Let me stop here. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for this important intervention, connection between uh, uh, work um, and, and, and labor and mobility, how we manage mobility that is mandatory, a type of mobility that is what most people use and how we approach it, because there's well, I need to, to, to solve this because many groups of people don't have a range of possibilities when uh, using or not using public transport. Hello, Lena. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Hola, muchas gracias para por, también. por la invitación. Uh, my name is Liana Vidifiel and uh, I am assistant to a member of the European Parliament in the Green Group. And yeah, this is a very relevant topic and uh, one of the main challenges of the ecological transition. Um, the issue is not only how to de decarbonize the transport sector without making it more unfair, but actually to use this necessary process to bring about more social justice. And we have a very good opportunity now, for instance, with a recovery and resilience facility. Um, but it's really important how we design this. We can't, again, do the wrong investments and the wrong policy choices because, yeah, we are simply running out of time. As you know, the EU Commission has proposed a Green Deal in order to foster this transition, including a European climate law that sets the objective within the EU legislation of achieving climate neutrality by 2050, and also an intermediate target to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% until 2030. And this will require a huge transformation of all the sectors. And uh, therefore, in order to achieve this, uh, the European Commission has proposed the so-called Fit for 55 package. And uh, this is a set of around 15 legislative proposals, and many of them has a particular emphasis on the transport sector, as it could not be otherwise. Because indeed, there are two sectors where the emissions are still not reducing, but they have actually been increasing in the last years. It's the building sector and the transport sector. And for that reason, the Commission proposed last year to extend the current emission trading scheme, the ETS, to buildings and transport. Because until now, the sectors covered by the ETS have been power and heat generation, energy intensive industrial sectors, and also aviation within Europe. And the ETS, as you maybe know, it sets an absolute limit on the total amount of greenhouse gases that can be emitted. And over time, that limit is reduced, so the total emissions are supposed to fall. And this worked quite well, at least in the power sector. But we Greens and European Parliament were against introducing this trading system for buildings and transport because uh, it would have a too high impact on the most vulnerable people. And also, we believe it's not the most effective way to reduce the emissions. But together with this new ETS 2, as it's called, uh, the Commission also proposed a social climate fund, uh, which is supposed to compensate for the impact on vulnerable groups of this new emission trading system. So what could be financed under this fund? Um, for the transport sector, the European Commission proposed, firstly, measures and investments intended to finance the uptake of zero and low emission mobility and transport, including transport and uh, shared mobility solutions. And uh, secondly, uh, a temporary direct income support to vulnerable households. And to access this fund, member states have to set up social climate plans where they lay out the investments and measures they plan and the criteria for who would be eligible for this direct income support. 
At the beginning of the summer this year, uh, the European Parliament adopted its position on both the new ETS2 system and on the social climate fund. And uh, yeah, we Greens were very happy that the position that was adopted by the Parliament foresees that this new extension of the ETS to buildings and transport from the beginning will only apply to commercial buildings and road transport. So to start with, citizens will not be directly affected. And the Parliament also strengthened the proposal of the Social Climate Fund and determined that the general objective of the fund is to contribute to a socially fair transition towards climate neutrality that leaves no one behind, which is precisely the topic of this seminar. The Parliament also introduced a definition of mobility poverty, and that's for the first time in uh, EU legislation. Um, and that is to make sure that the fund reaches especially those who need it the most. And this was one of the priorities for us Greens and something that we really pushed for. The Parliament also voted for more detailed social climate plans, asking the member states to provide a detailed analyse analysis on the main causes of uh, mobility poverty and to set targets and objectives to reduce the number of people in mobility poverty. When working on this social climate fund, we have had very long discussions in the Green Group as for how to balance the funding between the structural investments, which are more long term, and the temporary direct income support. Because on the one hand, in these time, times of rising fuel and energy prices, it's important to help people to pay their bills. But on the other hand, we have to make sure to not only help people today, but to make sure we make the right investments that can actually help lifting people out of poverty in the long term and that contribute to a sustainable transport system in the future. In the end, we were quite happy with the final outcome of the report that devoted a larger share up to 60% for the investments and maximum 40% for the direct income support. As Greens, we also pushed for measures and investments supporting a modal shift from private cars to public uh, shared and active mobility. For instance, we pushed for investments to make public transport more accessible and affordable, infrastructure for active mobility, such as bike lanes and fast cycling routes. And we also pushed for investments supporting different shared mobility services like car sharing and pooling. And this logic was finally included in the report from the Parliament. Right now, the European Parliament is in the middle of the interinstitutional negotiations with the Council, so we will have to wait a bit to see what the final outcome will be. But besides these very recent developments, uh, I could uh, definitely not be here at the Comisiones Obreras headquarters in Catalonia talking about the social dimension of transport policy without putting the accent also on transport workers' conditions. And this, as we will see, has also an implication for the necessary transition. A few years ago, the European Parliament adopted the so-called mobility package, which was supposed to tackle in particular social issues of road transport and to prevent that workers are exploited. Um, the mobility package consisted of three legislative proposals. First, the posting of workers, which sets the rules for drivers when they are working abroad to avoid social dumping. Uh, secondly, driving and rest times, which sets rules for how, how long drivers can drive and how long they need to rest. And also cabotage, which tackled the rules when you go with a lorry to another country. Um, but here there was a loophole before, for example, if a driver goes with a Bulgarian lorry to Spain, uh, without such rules, he or she could stay for an unlimited time. And this clearly opened the door to social dumping practices, whereby more often, often those drivers worked under semi-slavery conditions. And this precariousness, including also not sleeping or resting in adequate conditions, besides being unacceptable from a worker's rights point of view, it posed increased risks also in terms of road safety. So therefore, during the negotiations, we Greens insisted that the vehicles have to go back to their country of origin on a regular basis. But for that, the right wing and conservative groups were attacking us, saying that 
uh, th that would lead to lorries going empty, which would increase emissions. But cynically, that has been the only file when they actually seem to care about emissions. It's a bit demagogic because this legislation is about ensuring social rights and internalizing the costs of road transport. Of course, we should not deny that the environmental implications of this kind of measure, but ultimately, the issue of empty runs is rather actually a failure of logistics because it's calculated that 20% of the trucks that are circulating in the EU are empty. So with better logistic coordination and pooling, this could be avoided. And uh, this will be easier with digitalization and intelligent transport system, systems. So we could possibly do both, respect the social rights and reduce the emissions, which is what we are discussing today. Another growing transport sector that is also known for its precariousness is the platform industry, and it's particular the driving and delivery sectors. The persons working for Uber and Deliveroo are often working under difficult conditions and are in a vulnerable situation. Many of them are migrants, and sometimes they are even working with rented accounts, working in someone else's name. During the pandemic, many of these workers, like Uber drivers, they lost their job opportunities, but they could not access sick leave or unemployment benefits, neither for workers nor for the self-employed. But about one year ago, the European Commission proposed a new directive which aims at improving working conditions for platform workers. Um, there are about 28 million people in the EU who work through digital platforms, and the majority of them are self-employed. But uh, the commission counts that at least 5 million workers may be wrongly classified. And with the new directive, many of these workers will be legally presumed to be workers, to be employed and they would be guaranteed the corresponding labor rights and social protection. The directive also regulates the algorithmic management for all platform workers. Today, we can see that the opaque algorithmic management can have a negative effect on workers' mental health, and it can cause excessive stress. This can also have, again, a risk on road safety because delivery riders are paid per delivery and therefore they are incentivized to cycle or drive as quick as possible. During the last year, we Greens have been working hard to strengthen the proposal from the Commission. And um, as you may know, in June, there was a huge leak of confidential files that showed how Uber breached law and actually secretly lobbied governments during its global expansion. It has been quite concerning to see that during the negotiations here in the European Parliament on platform work, um, conservative and liberals have been echoing the arguments from Uber and other platforms. In the next couple of months, the Parliament will vote on its position on the proposal. Until the vote in the plenary, I think it will be important that we Greens work together with the trade unions to ensure a progressive outcome. Another priority for the Green Group is the situation for women in transport. And gender mainstreaming is something that we try to always apply to all reports and the legislations that we are working on. The gender topic is raising more general interest. And actually next year, the European Parliament will adopt a specific report on the situation of women in transport. And if you want, and if we have a bit more time later, maybe I can expand a bit on this because there are many relevant things to say on that. But essentially, a very relevant conclusion is that a strong public transport network has also a gender dimension, because women tend to use public transport more than men. And car-centered transport policies therefore present a gender bias, as uh, Laura Dieges mentioned before. And this shows the role public transport play with regards to social equity. There are some political families, yeah, even on the progressive camp, that think that replacing all the combustion engine cars by electric cars will be the perfect solution for the climate crisis. But first of all, electric cars are far from affordable, especially for people with low incomes. And yeah, we all know about the gender pay gap. Secondly, electric cars 
do not solve the issue of congestion, which is calculated to cost 270 billion euro yearly at an EU, EU level, and is estimated to reduce the productivity around 30%, according to the European Court of Audit Auditors. Moreover, when it comes to freight transport, electric vehicles still present relevant limitations. So this is why we as Greens decisively advocate for a massive shift to rail and leaving the electric road transport for the last mile only. So to sum up, it is necessary to incentivize the shift to rail for both freight and passengers and internalizing the social costs of transport. Um, this is essential and to invest also in public transport. Actually, uh, there is a new trend of some cities introducing free public transport. Luxembourg was the first country in the world to introduce free public transport in the whole country in 2020. And this trend is part of a general shift away from car travel towards travel by bus, train, tram and bicycle. And this modal shift leads to less congestion in our cities, so less traffic jams and less emissions. Provided it has good quality, free public transport is also a social measure, making it possible for everyone, no matter the economic means to travel. But maybe the first question I would get is, how do you finance that? But according to a study by the Commission from 2018, it was called the Handbook of External Cost of Transport, it was estimated that on average, there is a cost per capita of 1,500 euro every year uh, associated to public investments linked with the system for private cars, like infrastructure and maintenance. And yeah, I think this uh, was also mentioned earlier by uh, David Luis. This is regardless of whether you have a car or not, uh, 1,500 euro per year and person. That is a lot of money. And if all of this, or at least a significant part, would be devoted to public transport, probably there you have sort of an initial, initial answer. But in any case, it's clear that to start with, we will need to funding at all levels. At the city level, this can be done by, for instance, earmarking certain contributions to investments in public transport, uh, like parking charges, city tolls or taxes, National and regional authorities should support those policies and investments also through dedicated taxation. And uh, I think it would be very useful to have specific EU funds for developing public transport, because this could really accelerate the transition to clean and sustainable vehicles and speed up the dig digitalization and support new and flexible forms of public transport, such as on-demand transport. And Finally, we need to be aware that only by making public transport free is not going to make more people use it, as also I think Georgina Montesinos mentioned before. Now, it is more important than ever to make public transport more attractive by investing heavily in infrastructure and service quality to make sure that trains and buses are fast, punctual and not overcrowded. In many places, it is also a question about expanding the networks and better coordinating the timetables to make it easier to travel. So to conclude, this is possible and already proven in an increasing number of cities, regions, and even full countries. All this is a matter of political will and priority and ultimately for whom the mobility policies are designed. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, Lena. Thank you, Lena. También. Be, um, yo su Very fare... interesting. Um, I will ask well, the information that we have accumulated with these four interventions. I think that the four of them were extremely complementary and excellent. We achieved a, a range, a very big snapshot of, of the whole situation. So thank you in advance to everyone. Let me ask a question or, or a possibility to add whatever you want, depending on what uh, you left aside or what other interventions suggested to you. David, I want to ask you a question. I'm, I'm sure you, you can add 
whatever you want to uh, my question is the relevant role of urban planning and the role that cities have and therefore in terms of mobility i would like to focus on this only but the difference between barcelona and madrid is very clear not only because you go to one city and go to the other you realize that there is a big difference between uh, the, the models the city models so a european dimension i will go back to, to lina there's a regional and a local dimension but the, the urban planning of cities has a, a, a very important a very important power of dragging policies in terms of sustainable mobility i don't know how you see this and maybe you can contribute with your your uh, contribution well, ultimately, in psychological terms, how can you design uh, uh, the built spaces? Well, this will orient the behavior of people and, and social groups. You can design spaces for uh, common life, to, to share life, or areas that increase uh, social lack of trust, as we could see before. The issue here is that if we compare this with the models, the, the archetypical model of, of uh, greater growth, like in most states in North America, but not only in North America, they, they generate uh, car dependent uh, spheres, a very strong orientation towards the building of uh, hard infrastructures oriented to uh, car use will ultimately generate uh, a spiral of further away uh, commuting we, we could see that in spain after the uh, the uh, real estate bubble in many municipalities uh, well, people did things without planning where there was a lack of planning therefore i think um, i believe now more than ever in all the different uh, promotions and developments and in, in and when treating uh, consolidated areas we had to give a priority to areas such as the subjective uh, social and, and psychological well-being, adaptation and mitigation, adaptation to the climate crisis, all these factors have to be key, the core elements, because ultimately the topic of public-private collaboration uh, ended, unfortunately ended, maybe, maybe uh, I'm being too tough, but it ended up in absolute subordination of urban growth so, in the hands of some few hundreds of people, this cannot be so, because the result in the case of, um, for example, of Madrid community, the growth was huge in, in the metropolitan area. Car commuting with origin and, 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 and destination, everything standard, but in the metropolitan area, the evolution was no good at all because um, the metropolitan area of Barcelona, I don't remember the, the evolution data, but I know that the capital is uh, balanced in the model distribution, but that's where we have the, the problem, the new uh, promotions, the new advances, and the, the superpopulation in certain areas. This generates some new types of behavior. Thank you. Let me add, let me add something. I thought it was very interesting element and that, that includes the i'm not a psychologist but i don't know how to call it well the attitude that does to do with our culture of mobility the psychological attitude the the, the, the internal uh, uh, behavior that connects with transport i think there is a public policies dimension but there's another element which is the cultural change individual and collective that it's evident that has um, uh, big levels of resistance i don't know if you can add a, a bit more on, on this because there's there's they measure that escapes a strict aspect of the public administration obviously they they have a role there but it goes beyond no the question is is here's the, the creation of an imaginarium i mean a certain imaginarium a certain concept was created about mobility and what it should be like and, and what cities should be like it's something very specific of the year of the of the 1950s of the past century through all cultural transmission 
what was was done, something similar to what was done with uh, tobacco smoking. Let's not forget the success, the, 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 the male success, the masculinity was built with respect to the car use and some uh, masculinity patterns, which are very toxic where you assimilate the deposition of a car and the possession of a woman. This is the publicity we, we received. All this is difficult to on to on route, but under a standpoint, um, under my standpoint, there's been a change, a clear change, quite a, quite a few, well, maybe 20 years, where we see indicators like what happens in the rest of the world. Girls and boys get their driver's license uh, later in their lives, even if you control the effect of crisis. Uh, but that trend continues, you know? Why such a delay happens? Because uh, uh, the essential uh, role is being weakened. I'm talking about cars and, and adult life. Aspects like, uh, as I said before, the attitudes of the population towards urban changes of wanting better, wanting better cities. Have some th things have changed. Elements such as what is being done in Barcelona, in central Madrid, and other areas. We see a trend in all cities, not only in Spain but also in, in Europe. Let's think about Brussels. Let's think about Paris. Let's think about London. All of this, uh, all of this wouldn't have been would have been impossible to to, to imagine. There have been some some levels of resistance, strong resistance in some cases, that, and many in many cases, really rooted in the in media systems that still observe equivalent positions, but and, 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 as as prevalent, and they are minoritary. But you know this happens all over the place. But I'm still optimistic, you know. <laughs> So are we, so are we. I, I have a question. We should be finishing at 7.30 and we have to be wise in the use of time. I'd like you to explain the urban toll concept. Why do you think the urban toll is so, so positive? You consider how this affects income levels, the, the different types of of uh, social typologies, because uh, with these pressure groups and with these uh, bags of resistance, uh, urban urban tax uh, affects my freedom, some say. But I know that you have a proposal that was quite uh, well structured, considering different levels of income while adapting to, to it, you know, income levels and urban toll. Can you summarize this? Yes. Working with uh, income is difficult. We, we could see that in other instances. There's a red line that needs to be crossed. But after when we observed the, the urban toll, we had a question in our minds how to avoid this comparative grievance. I don't know if we need to change to Spanish. Uh, it's true, the, the ownership of private uh, of a private vehicle is related to high income levels, but at times low income levels need to use a private transport. For example, if we have to uh, move with a person who has a disability and not and who's not able to use a public transport, in those cases, we consider certain exceptions. Exemptions, not exceptions, exemptions, she corrected herself. I don't remember them all now, but we observe these possibilities with vehicles that have a, a, a priority of passage, people who need their private cars for a specific need, you know, going to the hospital uh, on a frequent basis, low income levels for people who have the need of a vehicle for their, their work, you know, sometimes the vehicle is their, their work tool. Considering some margins and some limits, because at one, well, you have to set limits. And why not me and others? Yes, well, you have to say we have, that's the limit, that's the limit we have. I don't remember the figures, but uh, exemptions were different. We had the different exemptions listed, amongst which we had low income people, uh, address people, um, uh, unemployed people, 
all, the, all of these are concepts that we see in other spheres of parent like in in, in in rating and it helps and subvention it's in subventions well thank you it's on your website this is very well uh, explained in your website laura you said something which is very interesting there is a new uh, sector of activity platforms for example in the case of of um, home delivery many people use uh, riders uh, services and here we have a paradox because on the one hand not because companies want that but it's it's a transfer that we should call we should call sustainable because in the city we have to, to promote this type of sustainable transport but in social terms this is a highly precarized uh, and highly taxed uh, group of people do you think that the union tasks the union work and, and and reflection has to do with the fact that when we gather both elements the paradox is that this is the most one of the most sustainable types of transport but one of the most precarious types of transport right well i, I did i didn't talk about it i think that lena was the person that talked about it but from our union we analyzed this first of all I'm no expert on, on, on the topic, but the, the liberalization is, is the first step because this opens up new doors to enter in a collective bargaining situation. And from there is where you can uh, affect the transport systems and uh, how much will a pay, uh, company pay, more efficient transport systems, all the issues of rest, of um, uh, bonuses for different situations. You can analyze uh, whether there are any uh, biases of, of, of people in certain groups of people and therefore it's interesting to see all the area of healthcare and prevention of all riders and then the, 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 the bike transfer distribution the area of analyzing healthcare risks so that bikes that they use are more ergonomic the first point as far as i'm concerned is liberalization liberalization they are considered they have to consider to be workers are working for that platform because that is where we open up the possibility of generating a new analysis and changing things yes it's a paradox but it's also true that we see alternatives if i'm not mistaken organized by the workers themselves uh, uh, why writers themselves that consider the social criteria as well and this uh, is a positive element observing not only economic criteria but also a sustainable model uh, environmentally uh, economically and, and socially that is uh, what is really interesting thank you finally lena i think you could uh, briefly contribute uh, uh, with respect to mobility and, and gender yes exactly as um i mentioned before i can expand a bit on that topic um but yeah for instance quite often families have only one car and studies show that it's mainly men driving the cars and women tend to use public transport to much more than men so therefore to have a strong public transport network, it has a gender dimension. And that is another reason why it is so important to invest in public transport. But also um, when it comes to, comes to active mobility, like cycling, for instance, the infrastructure that is designed for it, uh, for cycling, um, there the risk perception of men and women is different. So um, a lack of proper safe active mobility infrastructure it can have an impact on women's willingness to shift to active mobility. Um, and yeah, this of course has consequences for the emission reduction, but it also has health aspects because as you know, cycling brings benefits for both reduced CO2 emissions and better air quality, and it has positive impacts on health. And um, yeah, talking about road safety, another example that uh, showcases the gender bias is that of the dummies for the crash tests of cars. Uh, because these dummies simulate an average male body, 
But of course, the male body has different characteristics than a female body. So since cars are designed for men, research show, has showed that women are actually more likely to be seriously injured in car crashes. And also a study from the UK from May this year showed that women are almost twice as likely as men to be trapped in a vehicle after a traffic coalition. So this is a, a really important aspect. And uh, that's why we have been asking for the development of crash test dummies that represent more variability of both age and gender and size. Um, yeah, that was just some example, but um, as I mentioned before, it is important to always include the gender aspect in, in all transport and mobility legislation that we are working on. And yeah, this is something that we as Greens are always trying to push for. And also, as I said earlier, we'll have a specific report uh, that will be adopted by the parliament next year that will focus on exactly women and transport and there we will um, raise all these issues there. Thanks. Bueno, doncs, eh, moltes gràcies a tothom. Gràcies. Well, I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you, David, Georgina, Laura, Lina, for uh, your collaboration, for your participation, either here in Madrid or Brussels. I hope to see you very, very soon. And uh, goodbye. Have a good rest of the, the day. Thank you all.